Welcome to this edition of When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine, a discussion of sustainable living and what that means to you and me. I'm Jay Warmke. I'm Annie Warmke. And today we've got a special little edition here, <laughs> which we're, we're sort of calling Dead White Guy History. We so, are. I thought they were scientists. Oh, dead white scientists. Okay. Oh, that's better. I like right, that Dead title. white scientists. Okay. Uh, okay. And, and I've saved the best for first, which is William Murdoch. Wow. Now, I'm going to let my geek flag fly here because... <laughs> I am so into all of what this. What color is that flag? Because I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> it is it is rainbow color, but today it is the colors of Scotland, uh, blue and oh. blue and white, blue and white. You know, I'm part Scottish. Um, that that must be why I have a fascinating. temper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so I want to talk about William William Murdoch, and I'm not talking about the William Murdoch that the Canadian Broadcasting company made into a famous detective in the William Murdoch mysteries. This is the real William Murdoch. All right. But why did you pick him? Because well, there are lots of guys. I know. And, 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 and we'll they're touch. all dead. Yeah. So why they're did you all pick dead this guy? White guys. So um, I, I don't know. Uh, William Murdoch to me is the best. He's the he's the absolute best engineer inventor that you have never heard of. He's like the Forrest Gump of inventors. Right? Okay, but here's the deal. Before you knew that, you're like, I'm going to write a book about him. And you didn't even know. It's something about him that drew you. What he's, do you think that is? I think it's because he's like, uh, well, we'll get into exactly what he did. But to me, I marvel at the fact that William Murdoch probably invented, but certainly had a hand in inventing Almost every major invention that has changed the world in the last 200 years, and nobody's ever heard of him. And the other thing that I marvel about is he didn't seem to care that nobody ever heard oh, about him. Oh, lack of vanity. I like that he already. He just wanted to invent stuff. He was he. He's amazing. All right. He's a geekoid. Let's be he's, honest. He's the Lost geeks in it. geek, right? All he right. is. He is the Messiah of geeks. So, let me go back. Let's go back. Seventeen fifty four. Whoa! I thought it was. I didn't think he was that old. Well, he's dead, so so he hasn't <laughs> continued to age. But he's born in seventeen fifty four oh. in in Luger, Scotland. Wow, where where's south, that? South uh, west part of Scotland, um, which turns out to be about twenty miles away from where Robert Burns was going to, or Bobby Robbie Burns, uh, going to be born about five years later in seventeen fifty nine. All right, but who's Robbie? Robbie Burns. Burns everybody if you were, might not I know. I thought you were Scottish, so Robbie no, Burns. I know who Robbie Burns is. Uh, every good Scotsman knows knows Robbie Burns, We're and Scots and we women. know um, we know. Old Lang Syne, you know, let old acquaintances. That's, yeah. But but he's did mostly he wrote that. He did. Wow. And and he wrote a lot of poems, most of which I, I mean, his probably his most um, famous is Scots Way He, right? Which was like the unofficial national anthem of Scotland, which is basically. I'm Scottish and I'm going to kick your butt, which is like pretty much everything he wrote. I about. never heard of this. No, the, well, I know everything here is new, and um, <laughs> so and and Robbie Burns. So, but he's not in the picture yet, right? All right. So, but why'd you bring him up then? He was five years. He's a, a five. A, oh, twenty it's the miles same away. Time period. All right. And, and, so yeah. lots of famous people being born in this right. area. Well, then? this was kind of a network. Well, we'll, we'll get there. Um, his mother, Anne Bruce. And Bruce um, descended from Robert the Bruce, the first real kind of king of Scotland. And if you ever saw Braveheart, oh, hey, you know, you can't take away our freedom. <laughs> well, that's William Wallace, but he was working with Robert the Bruce. And um, and his father, um, John Murdoch, so they gave birth to a little boy they called William. And um, so they grew up. His father was what's referred to as a wheelwright which is somebody who would have made and repaired wheels for um, carriages. Yeah. yeah. And his father um, was a bit of an inventor, I think. And, and this, of course, was a time and a location 
where this was all beginning to happen. I mean, for some reason, I keep thinking like Haight-Ashbury District in the 60s, right? You get this concentration of activity that later proves to be quite significant. But there are a lot of people interested in the same thing, and they all seem to be concentrated in a very specific locale. And his father used to walk several miles to um, the Lord of the Manor's um, place, this Lord of the Manor I've got. His name was Alexander Boswell, who became Lord, and I know it's like Achtenlich or something like that. I'm sure that's way wrong. But um, you got the spit part right. Yes, that's I know. All you that got it. That's all that Scottish <laughs> is, is basically phlegm. Um, I, I remember we were in Poor New Zealand Scottish. one time oh. and, and, and we were listening and, and you were asking me, he says, what language are those people speaking? <laughs> <laughs> I said, English. English. <laughs> uh, they're, they're Scottish. I mean, it I was, said, uh, you got to transport, trans, uh, <laughs> translate, translate for, for me. So anyway, so, so his father built what, what effectively became the first tricycle. They called it Murdoch's Wooden Horse. And he rode this tricycle because he's a wheelwright, right? Yeah, he made this little bike like a bike and he rode it. It had hand pedals. And and so his father was this kind of uh, amazing inventor. Um, and, uh, and of course, young William, young Billy, I'm sure, um, watched this and, and also had the same aptitude. So um, now the first thing that, that William got involved with was the steam engine. And if you've, if you've been to grade school, right, and we always like to say that everything you learned in school is wrong, and, and if we study the history of the steam engine, if you paid attention, um, they'll tell you that it's the steam <laughs> engine that was the heart and the basic basis of the Industrial Revolution. And that James Watt miraculously invented the steam engine and off we go. And that's what you learn in school. Well, of course, it's not true. Uh, the steam engine was really invented. Ancient Greeks had it. Ancient Egyptians the had Chinese it. Chinese, too, Chinese, the Chinese invented, invented everything. Invented, yeah, but in in the in the dead world of white scientists, um, it was Thomas. The world of dead white scientists. You got to right. get your title right here, Jay. Okay, I was being a little backwards there, but Thomas <laughs> Savory. Thomas Savory. Savory. Yes, huh. he in in 1698 invented what we would refer to as the modern steam engine. And he was British or he was... He was British. Or Scottish. No, I, I think he was British. But okay. he... Well, Britain, Scotland's part of Britain, but he was English, I think. Okay, English. Um, so, so, we, um, so he invents this thing. And it, it was invented primarily to, to lift water out of mines. That was a big issue. Oh, yeah. The mines would flood. Problem with his steam engine is it tended to explode. That's kind of tough. Yeah, little pro- little problem. So, in 1711, a fellow named Thomas uh, Newcomen he created a way of doing the same thing, but not under those high pressures. So it tended not to explode. So he modified that, but it was still very very inefficient. So 1765 comes along, James Watt. Fame and glory. He tweaks it a little bit. He the, he, the steam engine. Yeah, the steam engine. Mm-hmm. So he's a young engineer in college, and he says, "You know what? He can. He essentially modified the existing inefficiency thing. He, he created a uh, way of recapturing a condenser to recapture some of the used steam." Um, and, so and, it didn't blow up then. Then he well, stopped that because the, I thought it still did. It didn't blow up as much, <laughs> and it was a little more Killed efficient. less people. Yeah. So. so so he invents this thing, and he um, finds out that there are people that are interested in this, um, but he's broke and in debt. This is what what right. So um, um, so a fella named uh, Roebuck. Roebuck says he he ran a mine. He actually ran a um, a foundry and he needed coal, but it was always flooding. And he hears about this thing and he goes to he goes to Watt and he goes, you know what? I'll retire your debts. I'll pay off your debts if you give me two thirds of the company. So which he did. And they invested in it. And he actually brought Watt up to Scotland. He coming up to Murdoch. He was only not too far away from him. So he's working on the steam engine. Uh, Roebuck goes broke. A fellow named Bolton, who runs a factory down in Birmingham, 
In uh, England. In England. And he mm-hmm. says, hey, Jimmy, you want to come to work for me? Now, Bolton is manufacturing uh, buttons, buckles, and snuff boxes, right? The big business of buttons, buckles, and snuff I boxes. I bet it was a big business. Pretty big. I bet so he's was. got some money, and he's also got some business acumen. So, so he brings Watt. He pays off Roebuck, gets two-thirds of the company, and the famous Watt and Bolton manufacturing of steam turbines begins. This is where history kind of thinks, and now we get into the Industrial Revolution. Well, in the meantime, little William Murdoch's up there in Scotland, and he says, this guy James Watt, is a little bit older than he is, started this company. That's the place I want to go work. You know, he's 17 years old, so he literally walked from Scotland down to Birmingham, about 250 miles. And he shows up. He'd already met some of the people involved. He, his father had worked for Roebuck, so he knew these people. And he introduces himself. The legend goes he was wearing a wooden hat. Bolton said, that's a pretty cool hat. You can come work for us. You made it yourself. Probably nonsense. But he's already an engineer. good marketing. Yeah, well, and a lot of these biographers, you got to understand, the biographers are writing in a time when the successful person they want like a uh, this this upper crust person made good, the people who work for them are the servants. They're inconsequential. Right. Well, there, there's quite a hierarchy in the British. Right. And so anyway, um, so. But I just want to say something about that because right. because I think that enters into this maybe later in the story. But there is this caste system. Sure. And it would have been really hard to be somebody who was coming out of nowhere. So maybe the hat story is true because it showed he had skill. It showed he was clever. Um, well, I, don't, I think there's no doubt that he made himself a hat, but it's pretty unlikely he wore it from Scotland all the way down to well, uh, Maybe he carried to it and just put yeah, it on he carried that something day. cloth. But anyway, so, um, so he goes to work for him. He's 17 years old. Watt is like his idol. At this point, it would be almost like somebody going to work for Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak in the beginning of Apple. I've heard about these guys, read about these guys. These guys are great. I want to go work for them. So this guy shows up, and by really within a year or two, he's their lead engineer. The 17-year-old guy. Yeah, he's the one who gets sent off. Now, the egos involved— What's that mean, he gets sent off? Well, they're selling steam engines, right, to mines. okay. And these things blow up. These things stop working. Problems. So they send off young Murdoch. He said, all right, you go fix it. Well, he gets there, and because he's such a good engineer, he starts making modifications, right? Oh, it's not working so well? Well, I got an idea how to fix that. So he made literally hundreds of modifications— Well, the problem is Watt, who was also a pretty good engineer, he had the idea that anything he didn't invent was crap, you know? So so he took a lot of convincing that these things were improvements. I think part of – now, Bolton, on the other hand, is like, hey, we're making money. I'm happy about this. He's more the entrepreneur kind of guy. Watt's a bit ego. Fortunately, Murdoch didn't seem to have this ego. He's just a kid going, I'm just loving life. I get to play with these toys. I have resources available to me that I didn't have available to me before. I'm working for my idol. Um, life is great. So I think that's the only reason there wasn't early on this clash of, of gigantic egos. All right. At this point, we'll take a little break. I, and I was going to say, let me read. Okay, Annie, you All read. Right. So you're listening to When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine with Jay and Annie Warmke, reminding you that it's the end of the world as we know it. And, and thank God. All right. Thank God. So I'm I'm geeking out all about William Murdoch. I know. So you're we, talking a mile a minute I know. Here. I'm excited about it. Plus, there's a lot to cover and not much time to cover it. So anyway, so so William Murdoch, he's down there. He's working for this, um, for Watt and Bolton. He's going out, and at at some point, um, they decide, you know what, young Murdoch, you are so good at this. We want you to go over to Cornwall and take over our our activities over in Cornwall. Yeah, so, that's in the southwest of England. That's right. Yeah. And and you got to understand, that's where the mining district was. 
the well, coal, the coal mines, coal mines, tin mines, oh, a lot tin of these mines. mines. Too. Okay. Um, and uh, but the miners were pretty notoriously a rough and tumble bunch. And part of Watts' reason for sending Murdoch down there was he had already fled from there because he's trying to enforce his patents. Uh, Watts was? Yeah. He fled from there. Yeah, because people kept trying to, like, beat him up and kill him because he's trying to enforce his patents. Other people are saying, oh, oh, now I see how it works. Yeah, I can do that. But he's then suing them saying, you can't do that. I got a patent on this. And the miners are saying, you know, Here's your patent. I got your we're, patent we're right patent, here. Were patents pretty new at concept then? No, they weren't new, but they had to be enforced. And so one of Murdoch's roles was fix the stuff, but also prosecute anybody who violates our patent. So there were literally times, there's stories of 400 miners showing up at his house, carrying him out, threatening to throw him down a mine shaft, you know. And at some point, he got into these fist fights and stuff. In the meantime, Watt is sending him notes saying, oh, and by the way, watch out for these, um, these um, oh, what's the term? But uh, th- there was a war going on with France, and they kept grabbing people and impressing them into the military. Oh, like indentured, um, yeah, what the, do they call they, that? They, it was like press squads or something like that. But anyway, so he's hiding out from the guys who want to make him a soldier and send him off to France. He's getting beat up by miners. And again, the French are are stopping and stealing cargoes from ships that are arriving. So there's stories of Murdoch having to shoot at different pirate ships that are trying to steal their supplies. So they send off this seven, and he's 18, 19 year old kid to go down there to get beat up by miners, avoid getting drafted and shoot pirates all the time, reinvent the steam engine. It's actually conscripted. Conscripted. what well, I was trying to think of. But it, but it wasn't even that formal. It was more just walk along, find some guy who looks the right age and then grab him and throw him into the army. Um, so. So he's 23 years old now, down in Birmingham with his wooden hat, trying to keep from getting killed. And um, and then he starts thinking about, oh, he invents what's referred to as the sun and planet gear, which was another big thing. He takes this what was an up and down motion of a piston and turns it into a rotary motion. Well, once again, that's a big deal. If you think about basically like if you think about the locomotives where you see those right, things. Where it propels it forward. William Murdoch. There wow. you go. He invented that. So he's he's down there in Cornwall. He's a spy getting in spith, fist fights. <laughs> he's a spy. He's a repair guy. Poor guy. He's 19. Right? How much of a spy can he be? Know. He's constantly being sent off to London to testify. And he gets this bug under his wooden bonnet that says – you know what these these stationary wind turbine or wind turbines uh, <laughs> steam that's, engines that's wrong wrong century yeah, these these stationary steam engines if we were to put wheels like my dad had with his tricycle we could make steam engines that propel people down the road first automobile oh, yeah right yeah he's thinking about a steam powered automobile now this is like 1780s i mean a long time before the automobile scare became. the heck out of horses of course, yeah. And especially and people. when it blows up. <laughs> In fact, he invented a, a, a working model. And the story goes once again that he took it on the road, but he was, wasn't stupid enough to get on it. He's walking along next to this little um, steam carriage, and it got away from him and went running down the road. And the local preacher thought the devil had arrived <laughs> and went into conniptions, and he's trying to figure out how to stop all this. but. But the people in his town got to know this little steam engine here, and, and, and it, was, it was going around. Well, what's interesting is a young man next, moved in next door to, to William Murdoch in this little town in, in, um, in um, Cornwall. Cornwall. And his name was, and I'll mispronounce this too, but Richard uh, Trevithick. Trevithick, something like that. Anyway, largely credited the inventor of the locomotive. Wow. And was it he is, an engineer then? Or? He was a kid living next door to William Murdoch, and Murdoch tried to market this locomotive, essentially, and he went to Bolton and Watt and said, I've got this thing. I think it's the next big thing. It's huge. We need to patent it. We need to sell it. And they both told him, 
stick to your knitting, young Billy. You know, this thing's got no future. You know, don't do it. And he even tried to go and get it patented, and they stopped him because they they got more and Watt, more concerned. You mean? Yeah, Watt and Bolton. They were more afraid that he was wasting his time and might quit. So they did everything in their power to stop him from doing this. But he effectively invented the automobile and the locomotive, both sitting there in his little carriage in in, um, in his little cottage in in Cornwall. So already he's invented the steam engine or made it practical. Invented the automobile, invented the locomotive. So, um, so he decided that he would mess around with some other stuff. And ever since he was a kid, he was used to working with with um, coal that tended to give off little sparks. Um, they called it um, parrot coal, or the actual term was um, uh, cannel. Cannel or spit coal. It had cannel. Cannel coal, and it had uh, natural gas contained in it. So he came up with this idea of capturing natural gas from the coal, and then he would capture it in a bag, and he would rock around town like with a bagpipe, with a little flame coming out of the bagpipe, and he would keep that thing going, and and inv- basically invented the first portable gas light, and then he lit his home, the first home lit with natural gas. So he had gas lanterns all through his home. And he went back to Bolton and Watt and said, this is going to be huge, man. This is great. You guys need to patent it. He's like giving it to his bosses, saying, we need to manufacture this stuff. And they once again came back to him and and said, mind your own business, right? But this is the case, you know, that, that people seem to, over the course of humankind, get one thing that they can produce one thing that makes money and they just stay at it till they totally destroy it right, instead well, of looking at how it can become something else. It's really fascinating. Well, when it got to this stage, actually, they were involved in litigation trying to protect the steam engine patents. And they said, we don't have time to mess with this stuff. You know what? Let, just They must go have been making work. money hand over Oh, well, fist. they were, of course. But like with everything... There's a time and a place for these things, and these things change. But here, Murdoch almost single-handedly had invented the automobile, the gas light, another invention that just changed the world. Right. Well, um, being able to have light in your house steam at engine. dark. Yeah. Um, but at that point, he got so frustrated. He's like, uh, the mine owner said, hey, we'll pay you 500 pounds a year if you just come to work for us. Because by then, just keep the steam engines going. You yeah, mean? yeah, just just do your thing, man. And he's finally he's like, I quit, and he went back home. And he says, I give up on all this. To stuff. Cornwall or Scotland? Scotland, back home to Scotland. And it's it's a little unclear from the history what 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 he did. He was going to start up a gas company. Um, he's mostly known for natural gas for creating the gas light. It's kind of poor where he was from, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, kind of in the boonies. Mm -hmm. And um, so about two years later, he returned back to Birmingham and started up this this big gas works and essentially led to the gasification of lighting all across Europe. Um, But he never patented it, so he never made any money from it. It was other people who made the money. And... um, then he he was working once again for Watt and Bolton, um, and he was involved in um, working for a fellow named Robert Fulton oh. <laughs> to create the very first steamboat. Yeah. So he was the engineer who developed the engine of the steamboat. Wow. Although Fulton gets all the credit for it. He's the fellow who came up with the idea of selling things based on horsepower. He invented the concept, the term horsepower for engines to say how many horses did it offset in the power they used. To just show you the length and breadth of what this guy did, This, like I said, it's Forrest Gump of inventions. He's amazing. So anyway, <laughs> he created he – created, uh, a way to purify beer using cod, right? 
He, he cod the fish. Cod the fish, man. It used to be they purified it using sturgeon that had to be imported from Russia. Wait, they purified the water. That the beer were... itself. It took sediments out of the, oh, the water. So he, oh. so he basically rechanged, changed the beer industry. Now. Who couldn't love that, or especially if you're Scottish, right? Well, especially if you couldn't drink water, and beer was the primary source of what right. you were drinking. So what else? I mean, like I said, all the major things of the Industrial Revolution, steam engine, automobile, locomotive, steamboat, beer. <laughs> <laughs> they all right? go together They're somehow. All. But he didn't stop there. He invented the pneumatic lift using air wow. to lift things. He invented the steam gun, which actually then later became used to launch um, planes off aircraft carriers. He invented hot air gravity central heating using air and furnaces to heat homes. The, the system that we use today, he invented something called iron cement that allowed cement to harden in a way that was waterproof, airtight. Um, it was, I mean, it, it just goes on and on and on. And one of my personal favorites. <laughs> I can't wait to hear. <laughs> right. The pneumatic dispatch system. Every What's time that? you go to one of the banks and stick your check in that thing. That and it goes, sucks it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. William Murdoch. They had checks back then? I don't think they used it for checks. <laughs> they used it for other things. <laughs> like but, what? What would you use that for? Oh, like sending something up and down the coal shaft, uh, mine shaft? From tool. I don't know what they used it for. Let's uh, <laughs> <laughs> sending beer from, <laughs> from one, one building to, to the another. Next. Well, they were in kegs. Uh-huh. They were closed, but, so it might have been all right. <laughs> I mean, and this is a guy, like I said, the Forrest Gump's event. He was involved in all of these things, whether he invented it or he was instrumental in the development. He is the guy who is at the center. He's the Forrest Gump, right? He's everywhere. I know I keep saying I don't even know what that means, but that's uh-huh. for another show, right? Because I don't know what it means to be the Forrest Gump of anything. Well, you, I, I don't know if you saw the movie. but uh, I did see the movie, but I don't know what it means. Life is like a box of Well, one thing... I know that one. But one thing that's fun, and I think I just want to say this uh, at the end of the show, is that it's fun to be excited about stories. It's fun to tell stories. It's really worthwhile to understand where we've come from. And it's fun to watch you because you're so excited. I think you're about 12 years old today. but right. I And there's nothing wrong with that. But I, I, I wish for everybody that they have the experiences that we get to have together where we think about something and we research or we just go into it and we just jump in and say, wow, this is something inspiring and we want to learn more. And uh, and so it's been fun. But I know there's going to be a whole series, lots more dead white dead science white scientists. guys. Okay. Well, with that said, you've been listening to When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine with Jay and Annie Warmke, along with Emmy Award-winning producer Adam Rich. Wow. Thanking you for spending just a little bit of time with us and William Murdoch. And as your grandmother probably told you, secret to a happy and sustainable life is... Play nice with others. Clean up your mess, especially if (laughs) they're dead white scientists. And eat your vegetables. All right. Till next time. Mother Earth will sing and her children will be You can find more information on living sustainably in our unsustainable world at BlueRockStation.com.